continue. Uh, Agatha, if you want to fill everyone's cups before we start, so it saves us disturbing the talk. Yeah? Have you done that? Yes. I hope you had the, the pleasure to walk around and have a look at the exhibition before we sit down. And I know some of you have been doing this. This is a wonderful show of Evelyn's uh, recent work. They all came from Perth. So anyway, Evelyn sits in her in her dream, and we're sitting in her dream as well. This is the mind of Evelyn, and she had um, she has the power and the ability and the expertise and the genius to put her thoughts into form that we can enjoy. And so you can imagine, and I like to point this out, how daring it is to reveal your inner self, your inner world. And that's what artists do, right? They reveal what's inside, whereas we like to hide it <laughs> and don't really talk about it. Or you yourself know how difficult it is to reveal inner worlds of yourself. And not just to your family or friends or acquaintances, but to the public. So you can imagine how nervous artists very often are just before an exhibition opens to reveal themselves and to reveal their creation, how it is perceived. So um, you can see already we have quite a few sales, so it has been perceived really well. And these works are really, truly beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, for those who don't know, the Blake Prize that she won two years ago is also hanging here, this, this wonderful triptych. And, uh, and I just pass things on to you now, Evelyn. Thanks, Thanks for being here, coming all the way from Perth. Uh, it's not a, a little thing, you know, even though it's Australia, but it is uh, further away than Germany and North Africa <laughs> in relation. <laughs> so thanks for coming. Thank you for having me coming. Thank you for your words. Um, um, I'm not a terrific ad person at ad living. So I've written something down, I hope you don't mind if I just read it, and then we can perhaps have a conversation. Um, so I was born in Perth in November 1950, of Hungarian parents who migrated to Australia um, earlier the same year. So as the youngest of six children, I was the only one born in Australia, and I was referred to the dinky die as a dinky die <laughs> in the family. I've always been in awe of my parents' brave step into the unknown and their ability to rebuild their lives after they'd endured 10 years of heartbreak and turmoil in war-torn Europe. Set, set to the background melodies of pinging pots, my father was a ceramicist and he would always bring the pots home and they would be pinging for several days. My inclinations toward art began at home with unconditional encouragement to explore the arts. Despite having attended numerous art institutions after matriculating in 1968, I was unable to complete an art degree, partly because, partly due to circumstances, such as the sudden death of my father in 1970, and partly due to finding no solace in the direction that formal art education was taking at the time. I actually wanted to major in drawing, and there was no such thing as a drawing major. Um, but anyway, I had to leave and get a job. So, um, I, I was fortunate enough to catch the tail end of some very rigorous training in drawing, which was still in, in effect at Perth Tech and Wait in the late 60s. The most sure lesson from that model is that the accumulated knowledge gained from direct experience via observation, perception and materials remains the most trusted source of my inspiration. My early practice was simply drawing, mostly referring to my immediate surroundings, which for seven years was the Margaret River landscape. Some eight to ten years of learning the instrument of the eye was like learning and practicing scales in music, and I feel sure that it was this self-imposed apprenticeship that allowed me to recognize a true mark from a wrong one. Ironically, after years of drawing what I could see, I was instinctively drawn more to capturing the unseen. And this led to an editing process that would gradually distill perceptions into evocations rather than literal interpretation. 
So I've pushed, over the years, I've pushed the boundaries of a variety of media, and I won't go into that because there's so many different things I've, I've done, um, but always searching for the right tone. And here I am with my recent work, um, which transforms pre-existing paintings into stitched and glued collages in a way that responds to a world of underlying rhythms and inherent structures. It's a world sensed, but not seen. I'm, I began by cutting up, reconfiguring and stitching my completed paintings. And these pre-made palettes were at once restricting and liberating. And they were lim limited by what was available, but it was also open to endless permutations. And these explorations progressed naturally to needing more variables to work with. So I began, tailor, tailor, began creating tailor-made palettes of organic colour and form with their subdivision in mind. So I was planning what I was going to be cutting up. But there was still a lot of freedom. And these impromptu services began a process of unfurling. And I found that cutting and stitching in particular sequences created a new order, and one never quite knows what will emerge. Sometimes the results cry out for another layer of interference, so I'll apply a mask of latex and then repaint it, allowing a new section of the visual chorus to merge into a formless and complex harmony that is endless in its renewal, and this is an example of one that's had the latex added. Um, it's occurred to me, I, I, Giles and I talk, but my husband's an artist also, we talk a lot about um, the d direction that art is taking. And uh, we talk about uh, this thing of visual expression being a little hijacked by words. Um, not just by words, but a need to justify its existence. So a lot of artwork will have a huge didactic next to it. Um, and you have to look at that before you can connect with the work. So you've got to find an entry point. Um, whereas writers, writers are able to create a picture with a simple phrase. And each reader imagines it differently. But when an artwork in, imposes its meaning, it can actually prevent them from align, prevent the viewer from aligning the work to an inner experience. It just seems like an illustration of the work. <coughs> um, I'm, I'm going to refer to a conversation at the Melbourne Writers Festival last year with Peter Sheldale, who's an art, art writer who I really like. He's, writer. He's a poet also for the New Yorker, and he stated, and I quote, "Art is a language of silence." You can't talk about art, you can talk around art. I can talk about my experience of art. Artists and students these days have to write artist statements. That's insane. What they should do is write each other's. I don't have to paint a picture to get an English degree. I thought that was a great sort of point. On abstract art, I just want to say a few things. The main thing that's missing in the experience of seeing these days is time. Most people spend but a few minutes looking. One needs to live with the art, with abstract works in particular. They're to be experienced without knowledge. That's just one way of looking at it. Just as the photographic surface is light sensitive, an abstract painting can be mind sensitive, where exposure allows different projections of self at different times and in different states. And you meet the painting halfway. That requires time, not, not, a, not a didactic. And justifying the content of visual arts creates a crisis of confidence for both the, the artist and the viewer. For the artist, it causes a low and constant murmur of doubt, a critical voice that inhibits the creative impulse. For the viewer, there's been a loss of confidence in seeing and getting it, seeing it right. Sadly, we're now in the habit of going straight to the didactic on the wall before looking at the work, not trusting our own ability 
to experience or be convinced by the artist's intent. So I just wanted to say that being conscious of meaning is not what drives my work and neither is the need to talk about it. Its visibility is the entry point. Having said all that, I'll, I'll now attempt to give voice to, to my own work. To begin with, I feel it's more in line with musical composition than words, where the unfurling of complex harmonies takes one into a direct experience, just as music does. There's no questioning. You relate to it or you don't. But my explanation, so, my explanation will be indirect by describing what my work is not. <laughs> a bit like being un-Australian. We don't quite know what being Australian is, but they always say, oh, that's very un-Australian. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to look at the rest, whatever, I'm not. So it's not figurative. <laughs> it's not political or social commentary. It's not ideas or theory based, and it's not about suffering, pain, or angst of humanity. It's not about harnessing time in a historical narrative. And it's not cynical or anti hope. It's not hot housed or genetically modified, and it's fo not focused on external reality. It is, I hope, atmospheric, unhurried, part of a continuum. Lyrical and rhythmic, edited and distilled. It is based on observation and experience. It is the dis disintegration and renewal of matter. And it is obedient to and trusting of nature. It's inquisitive, exploratory and inspired by material. It's self-sufficient and focused on internal reality. Its aim is to awaken its aim, I don't know if I achieved this, but it, its aim is to awaken imagination, to be still but not stagnant, and to evoke rather than capture, to connect to unspoken thoughts, to nourish and replenish, to bring the mind home, to present clarity, recognition and awakening. Emily, would you mind repeating that? Yeah. The aim? Yeah. yeah. To awaken imagination, to be still but not stagnant, to evoke rather than capture, to connect to unspoken thoughts, to nourish and replenish, bring the mind home, to present clarity, recognition and awakening. So that's all I've written. Um, I have got a a quote here from the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying about creativity. The Sojo Rinpoche in the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying says of artists, one of the manifestations of enlightenment is a being through whom some degree of illumination works to benefit and inspire others as an impulse, a spontaneous <coughs> expression. Just as light radiates from the sun without the sun issuing directives or giving any conscious thought to the matter, it derives its ultimate inspiration for the, from the dimension of truth, an energy that springs from the ground and source of all things. He goes on to say, I think of art as like a moon shining in the night sky. It illuminates the world, yet its light is not its own, but borrowed from the hidden sun of the absolute. Art has helped many towards glimpsing the nature of spirituality. Well, that's your subject, if you'd like to add to it. So, um, that's all I've written, but we're open to discussion. Beautiful. Yeah. Shall we talk about the work? Or? Yes. I can just first of all say, what a beautiful moment yeah. to be able to share here together in the middle of Sydney of the times we're in, and to just connect on that topic. I have tears in my eyes, and it's just so beautiful that there is the opportunity to actually share something so creative, divine, and beautiful that we actually all yearn, mm -hmm. and we have no moments or time or opportunities for this to happen. 
Oh. And thanks for sharing this with us. Well, yeah, thank you for the charity. Making me put it into words. Yeah. Because mm. you don't do that very often. Yeah. If you don't put it into words, it doesn't exist. Yeah. It's always true. an anticipation or um, um, an, an, unexam an unexamined assumption that it's there. But it's, if it's not spoken or if it's not revealed, it, it does, it's just non-existent. Yeah. It needs to be reiterated, yes. so that can yes. create a reverberation mm -hmm. throughout the And we world. know all that, what you said, but it's important to remind us of this actually every day, mm. because it slips our minds, our consciousness, our awareness, because the world out there as it is at the moment, it is highly aggressive on all levels, and <clears throat> Whatever it is, may, may it be at work, where there is bullying going on, may it be the advertisement and, and marketing, which is absolutely, completely aggressive, or if it's the news where we can only see war, war, war and aggression and, mm -hmm. and terrible things happening, it is important that we help each other to nourish the goodness that is in, in us mm -hmm. and, and to feed that daily by hearing things like this or to even expose ourselves um, daily with something of that kind mm. to help ourselves yes. just to stay alive and sane. I had someone come here who was actually the the ex director of the Sydney Biennale, and uh, she came to me and she said, Connie, you know what? It's such a joy to just come in here to experience this moment just of quietness of a language that only I understand because the way I interpret it because I am losing hope in this world. I really, she said, seriously, I am losing hope in this world of seeing just the things that are happening around the world every day. She just, she just doesn't know where to take hope from anymore. Mm -hmm. And so if we, we, if we start to create places, spaces, atmospheres, where people can find that hope again and, and that peace or that that moment of quiet where we find our sanity. Um, if we don't have that, people will despair. Yeah. So I always, because my father was a potter, I used to watch him centering the pots. And I always think in my mind when I'm even if I'm meditating, um, or how, how focused you have to be to center that pot. And if you lose your, it just goes wobbly. And I think, well, Many of us are very, very wobbly. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to find that center in mm -hmm. You need to have power to find the center mm -hmm. and the willingness. And that willingness is challenging us every day to make conscious decisions. And unless I make that conscious decision, the center is far away. Yeah. We're always in one side or the other, in yeah. balance. And then we suffer. Mm. <laughs> Speak okay, <laughs> <laughs> Can I please ask you a bit more about the Lake Pies yes. and what um, made you choose those works and what the, the writing is? Yeah, it's actually a melding of my artist, my art practice, and my Buddhist practice. Mm -hmm. um, so there are three three different mantras. Um, one is for compassion, um, one is for removing obstacles, and the other is for retaining strength, I suppose. I mean, that's very basic. Um, and the, uh, I guess the uh, uh, Sanskrit words. So I wrote the mantras. Uh, with the, with the, the concept of Buddha, Buddhism is uh, impermanence, of course, and cause and effect. Um, I wrote the mantras, I cut the mantras. Each, when I cut the mantras, I, I said the mantras again and then stitched them, said them again. So it was, a, it was a, um, a, a practice to bring the mind home and generate um, compassion and um, mind strength, I suppose. Um, the concept of Buddhism being impermanent, like, you know how the, the Buddhist monks create mandalas, they'll spend a lot of time creating Buddha and then it's just washed away. So having said the mantras, they are then in in the ether <coughs> reverberating and then 
uh, each time I say them. So, so then the artist, the art, the actual artwork, obviously had to become a an aesthetic decision at some point. It wasn't just about doing that; it was an aesthetic decision to make, and even balance between positive and negative because that's what life is made up of—the energy that's created between those two. So, so each each one has a certain tone and a certain amount of positive and negative, the lighter and the medium and the darker. So, um, and, and you could also see it as a universal text, perhaps, if you wanted to. But it's really, it's really an aesthetic decision to make it like that, but it's also an opportunity to practice. So I don't see the cutting up of mattress as a... Um, destruction of those words, I see it as a regeneration of those words. And, and then you ended up with you ending up with something else. Well it's a nice point that you say that the destruction, the, dis the, act, the act of destruction becomes an act of transforming. Yes. yes. Transforming it into something else. Yes. <clears throat> we experienced that yesterday when we created, um, I taught yesterday how to curate and we created an exhibition. Yeah. And it was only up for five minutes, and then we had to take it down and destroy yeah. it again. Mm -hmm. Whereas we, uh, in say for instance, in art therapy or, or things we do up at the meditation space, sometimes to invite people to be creative, they create a little picture or image of their feelings or of their meditation, and you have no idea how attached they are to it and want to keep it. They cannot mm -hmm. even leave it. Mm -hmm. So try and put yourself into that situation where you create something and then you actually destroy it again. Mm. This is a very, very powerful process of letting go mm. and um, very important because life consists of creation and dying. Yes. Of being born and of dying, of yeah. changing. Actually of changing. And it's true. Change. Everything yeah. is still there. Yeah. Everything is still there. It doesn't matter what yeah. Our ego comes in and takes yes. hold. Yes, and that shows the strength in itself, isn't it? Mm. That, that you have the strength to actually destroy your creation. Mm. But I guess that with the years of experience you had, the more faith and trust you have in the process and in yourself that something else comes out of it mm. that you like again. <laughs> right? Yes, yes. <clears throat> it doesn't always happen, but... It doesn't always happen? I have got a few, I don't know what to do with piles. I've <laughs> 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 got to a point where, where <clears throat> uh, come to an end, a sticky end, but um, I still keep them in the corner just in case. Good idea. No, no, obviously. I just want to say thank you so much. I think the work, um, I think what you said was that you don't often get the opportunity to be to uh, state your space of introspectiveness, which you hope that the viewer actually experiences. So the experience of me personally, and I'm sure everyone here today, to, um, as Connie has already expressed, was very intimate. And that intimacy, which, which your work allows us to step off in other directions and just maybe have a glimpse of who and what you are, um, it is a very beautiful thing to be able to do that. So I thank you very much. Oh, it was a beautiful, beautiful sharing. Thank you. On all levels. I find the work very exciting myself. And I love the, uh, con the conceptual nature of that it um, is never ending. That it, it is all, it, it, even your pile in the middle, something will come up. Something always does. Whether you like it or you don't like it, something always will occur. Yes. Yeah, you, you mentioned how uh, two people can read the same body of work in writing yeah. and have a totally different impression of what's happening. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, I, my background is writing, so uh, Arthur Kersler talked about the act of creation as the reader's activity, not the writer. And I think uh, with abstract, the beauty is I can come in here and I can, I can look at abstract art in the same way. I'm inventing what's happening mm -hmm. because there is no deductive, there is no paragraph, and there's no figure. There's no history of this, uh, like a European, uh, mm -hmm. that this is the Duke of so and so and this was painted on, the, mm -hmm. on his anniversary or whatever. It's all about my experience, and this is what Arthur Kersler talks about the mm -hmm. act of creation 
I'd also like to bring in physics because Albert Einstein taught us that the same thing can be seen by, from two perspectives and both are absolutely right. And that's something that Europe learnt in the 1910s, 20s, and that's when Gershwin started writing, rewriting symphonies in his own way. And, and my enjoyment today is about coming in and being able to argue and say, no, it's not, that's not what it's about at all. <laughs> the act of creation that I get, the enjoyment I get out of interact my history and my experience with what you've done. So I thank you for that. Yeah, oh, that's great. I don't know if you can connect with that because it is someone else who... That's a connection, isn't yes, it? Yes, that's exactly and, what it is. And it's different for each person. And I totally agree. I hate reading the, the story that the yeah. artist says. I, know, I yeah. don't want to know what they think. No. They put, they, they put their thesis on the wall and I'm going to do with it what I want. <coughs> yes. Yes. I, I think I would like to add something. I met Evelyn, I think, about six years ago. She was having a, an art exhibition at Dang Street. And I found her very generous, very kind and encouraging. And I think it's reflected in the work. I do really love it. Evelyn, I thought for somebody who, who uh, professed an uneasy relationship with words, I thought you spoke beautifully. Oh, what you said was beautiful. The way the way you wove the you know the internet, the personal, the work, the beyond. Mm -hmm. The way you wove it together was beautiful. And um, so perhaps you're you're uh, much more erudite <laughs> than, you, than you believe yourself to be. Well, I always find that there's more to be said whenever I try and encapsulate um, a sentence. There's always more to be said. But um, when I first saw the work, what, uh, I saw music. Ah, good. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was the first thing that, um, the first perception I had. Oh, this is so musical. Mm -hmm. And and also that, that dance and relationship. <coughs> So it was beautiful on that. And I'm quite fascinated with um, the energy with which an artist or someone creates something, how that transmits in the work. Mm. You know, that quite fascinates me. And um, that, uh, but it's, it's the capacity to stay with the work, to, to be still, stay with the, the work and allow it to speak to you, allow it to reveal something. Mm -hmm. And um, the first time I became sort of really profoundly aware of that was an exhibition of Robert Thomas. Did you see his beautiful exhibition at the National Gallery some years ago? No. And you know how, how abstract Rose's work is. And there was absolutely beautiful work of his and very minimal, beautiful uh, colour feel. And I was standing before this and I, I found out that I started I started weeping, yeah. mm. but I thought, wow, you know, that this, this, the, 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 the inherent power and energy in this world. Mm. And uh, I spoke to the curator, and it wasn't anything in the title, and that's what I love. I agree with you about this long text next to the work, that, and because we're so such a word and intellect dominated culture, we tend to go straight to the text before we go to the work. And, um, which a lot of Aboriginal curators <coughs> don't like either, by the way. And, uh, and apparently it was about the killing times, the painting was about the killing times. So that, that, that's what he was, he, that's the experiential memory and state of being that he was in when he was doing the work. So I thought it's really profound. So that you know that that moment has stayed with me, and I'm very conscious of that now in experiencing the work. And these are beautiful. I mean, it's all beautiful. But, you know, when I was standing up there looking at the problem, my first thought was, "Oh, there's some like some Aboriginal works." Mm. I don't know if a lot of people say that. Yeah. You know, Kathleen Bichari. Yeah. No, like, it's yeah. got that. Yeah, there's a um, relationship with connection, spiritual connection. Yeah. And the evilness of application and yeah. presence of mind when, when doing that. That's true. Yeah.
horizontal works yeah. and whether or not I think the infinite that the idea of the horizon is so present in Perth yes that's true if I have an if I think of Perth I see that ocean and I see that mm -hmm. flat ocean with the sun you know whether it's you know at various times of the day and I very yeah. much that and, um, I, I tend to do this this wide panoramas, which are difficult to hang in a small space on, unfortunately, but... Um, <coughs> that one is a horizontal work. Yeah, so yeah. to get them all in, we've, 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 <laughs> we've, we've, we've turned the horizon <laughs> around. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so beautiful, it has to hang. And so Evelyn is so generous that she actually puts four crosses in the back, uh, telling the uh, curator or, or, or client you can hang it as you want. Not every single one. Yeah, it's um. I'm from South Australia, so I'm getting like air, not the ocean. The salt lakes. The salt lakes. Yeah, this is beautiful. That is a very particular beautiful work. It's actually got another title which is called a rehearsal for a blank canvas, mm -hmm. which is, I, I see as a, well, in the Buddhism, Buddhist theory, is that when you are, when you become, to, to reach a certain level of enlightenment, um, you, <coughs> you still have trace elements of, of your, your impure, impure mind. So it's, <laughs> But that's not impure, that is a happy mind. That's a happy mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's completely white. But it's also, you know, um, I guess it's about death, really. It's, um, really? The, the blank canvas is, but I don't, yeah, I don't see death as a black thing. I see it as a white. You see, it's very calm. Hmm. This has two elements in it calmness, yeah. quiet, and, uh, and happiness because of the many colors that are in it. And it has character as well, because they're not all linear and very straight and, <coughs> and, and accurate, but they're shaped in, in all kinds of directions. And I, I think that's, that shapes the character, like the, um, the wrinkles in a, in, in a person's face, which shapes the character. Yeah. And, and that is such a powerful work. And then can you tell me what about the road trip detour? What is it about? Oh, the road trip to tri 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 yes. Well, um, my husband Giles did a painting called Road Trip, a series called Road Trip. And he's, that painting, uh, he, is, he was experimenting with different media, mediums, and with oil, and um, they uh, were cracking up a little bit. So he was checking it out. <laughs> so it's a detour from the road trip, okay. <laughs> but it ends up <laughs> yeah. ends up looking like a landscape, like you're travelling through the landscape. It's a anyway. collaboration. Yes, it's a collaboration. This is Giles, by the way, my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a comment on that? 
He always has to worry about his paintings. Oh no, she's cut up another one! <laughs> But it's, I'm lucky, lucky to have another artist in the family to bounce off ideas and talk about things. What is your relationship with music? Mm, I just appreciate music, and my mother, my mother was passionate about music and played the piano. But um, I know it could have been a. a could have done, been something I could have done, but mm. I, I didn't, I went the other way. Yeah. So, yeah. not a great relationship except for appreciation. Mm. So they come through this Yeah, does that? Mm. 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 Thank you. It's only one life at a time. At a time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
it just the work on it work and then again the whole painting was big as that got, I got cut up. Again. No, I feel very I had an amazing time working with Evelyn in the studio. I feel very privileged to have had that time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I've got one question. Yes. <laughs> um, I love this wall here. And is that a new direction for you? Or? Yes. Mm. It is. glue things down quite solidly. So um, some of those things are glued down. I was also yeah. reconstructing um, from old bits and pieces and then painting over and then sanding back. So my new painting tool is a removal tool. Um, mm -hmm. It's a great thing. Um, orbital sander. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was trying to... It's about, re you know, covering up and revealing and covering up. Yeah, some of them have got four or five, six, mm -hmm. seven coats. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I just wondered at the because this this work behind you, which I really like a lot, this one, the mm -hmm. slightly larger scale, mm -hmm. and yeah. that you know that the scale is uh, enlarged in these small works. Yeah, that's an And I yeah. like that a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a bit bold with that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Thank you. Quite completely <coughs> different from this. Mm. Quite different. Aren't they? Yeah, I, I can't see a difference in my work. I feel when I'm making, uh, whether it's a portrait or landscape or abstract, it feels the same to me. So. Yeah, I mean, obviously it looks different, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a part of the same thing. Well, it's your signature. Yeah, you develop yeah. a signature and it just always shines through. It just always emerges again and again because mm -hmm. it's you. Yes. That's what I was talking the other day at the, at Kofa. You've got to, you have to have such a confidence of your artwork that it is you through and through. And if unless this is you, you're not an artist, not a professional artist. You're a hobby artist, but then you need to know that you're a hobby artist. You know. Mm -hmm. But if you really pursue something professionally and really Surrender to yourself and the art. You have it has to be you through and through. Right. And when that happens, the only thing you can make is your signature that you develop. That is you. Yes, even though and that's why that's you, <coughs> yeah. yeah. And that's why you said I can. I can't see a difference in any. Of yes. Um, obviously, it looks different, but feels the same. Yes, but I also would like to point out an, an amazing skill uh, or a genius that uh, Evelyn has um, because some artists are very good in small works and some artists are very good in very large works. But in Evelyn's works, no matter what size they are, they never ever lack power. The small works are just as powerful as the big ones. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> very often artists can only do either or. And, uh, and that's what always surprises me in your work, no matter what. No matter how small they are, no matter how big they are, they're always powerful. It never diminishes oh. in its strength. <laughs> I mean, look at this work on the, in the corner. I mean, I mean, this is just so amazing. <laughs> this, right? It's sold. And, uh, and so it should be because this is one of the best works here in the, in, in, in the show. It is very complex, it's very rich, um, and I, I would like to relate to what you said, Anna, before. Um, <coughs> when you see minimal art, you really like relating to a Robert Thomas. Mm -hmm. You have to bring a lot with you, and if you are rich inside yourself where you can detect and feel yourself through others' language mm -hmm. or notes or concerts or performances, <coughs> you can identify it. If you're constantly hooked onto what society nowadays is, onto explanations, and immediate recognizable things, um, then you're completely lost because things never seem what they appear to be. 
So if you see some recognizable thing instantly, a lot of people feel confident and safe with this because they feel unsafe in unknown territory. <clears throat> so if you see an abstract word, this is unknown territory because you're stepping into someone else's space that they, he or she, identifies. But if you cannot relate to anything in that, you're lost. A lot of people are lost with, with, with minimal art. But if it triggers something in you, it shows your richness, that you relate to some hidden richness in that work. Because as you know, all, <clears throat> all artists that drew once figurative and then became minimal or monochrome artists or yeah, minimal artists, mm -hmm. all that knowledge, all that experience they had before in the figurative works is getting condensed into these minimal mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and as an experienced eye or person, mm -hmm. you detect that, mm -hmm. you, you, you suss it out. Because it's that, it's that stripping away, stripping away, stripping mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. Just to that, that um, inherent marriage between the creative, just destructive thing, mm -hmm. create, stripping away, stripping away. And that, and that um, to, to get to the essence of, exactly. of something. And, and then, of course, that energy mm -hmm. is so uh, powerful. And you connect to the core, yes. and the core, the seed, is always filled with the with the detail. Yeah. Yeah. So the yeah. connecting with the essence and the have the ability to be able to do that. Mm. Well, yeah. that, <coughs> that is what what actually reading contemporary art is all about, really, isn't it? Mm. To when find your confidence. In I was amazed when you get a little packet of seeds, yes. and, and it's for the Hans Hansen trees. And you can hardly see them, and they have all that information in them. So it's very much like doing that. Yeah. Mustard seeds too. Yeah. Very tiny, but yeah. it grows into a huge group. Right. <coughs> Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. is on until the 27th of September mm -hmm. so you're very welcome to tell your friends mm -hmm. to come and see the show mm -hmm. thank you very much yeah. continue to have breakfast <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>